guys, incredibly grateful for your attendance. Joey, I'm gonna turn it over to you and thanks again, everyone for being here. Yes, I'd just like to echo what Cass has said. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we have an incredible lineup of panelists and I'm really grateful to be a part. Um, the, the real idea is to really emphasize the importance of Western Red Cedar and discuss some of our concerns with some recent observations in dieback and, and some possible solutions um, that we can, we can work to together to, to understand what's going on. Um, so first we have the real privilege to have been joined by um, Mr. Gary Morishima, and he is coming to us from the Quinault Indian Nation, and he is the technical advisor um, of natural resources to the president. So I um, turn it over to you, Gary. Thank you for joining us. All right. Well, thank you. I'm trying to... Uh... Okay, can you see my screen there? Excellent, yes, thank you. All righty. Well, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about uh, Western Red Cedar. It's called Chittamen Quinault language. It's also the, known as the tree of life to the Northwest tribes. I'm going to share with you a little bit of perspective of a former forest manager uh, of one of the uh, areas where Western Red Cedar was quite predominant. Uh, the Quinault Reservation is located on the Pacific Ocean, roughly 120 miles due west of uh, Seattle. It was once the home to a pretty large forest of Western Red Cedar. Uh, Western Red Cedar comes in many forms, has many different uses. Uh, Northwest tribal cultures were tied very closely to Western Red Cedar. It's lightweight, it's versatile and durable, meaning that it's uh, readily available for use as building materials for shelter. It was also used extensively as an expression of uh, spirituality and totem poles and carvings and rattles and those sorts of things. Western Red Cedar was used in clothing, basketry, art, food, music, uh, fishing, and ceremony. Uh, it also was used very extensively in transportation. This is a photo of, uh, of a canoe log that was ready for carving. And canoe logs in the Northwest, uh, or the canoes made from these logs in the Northwest have multiple forms, from the traditional form on the bottom left to the modern racing canoes uh, on Quinault uh, on the right. But Western red cedar, the, the Quinault used to have some of the largest red cedars in the world. Uh, the largest one recorded was had a height of about 174 feet, a circumference of over 62 feet, 45 of uh, foot canopy width, and contained over 15,000 cubic feet of wood. That made them very valuable for commercial purposes. And logging on the uh, Quinault Reservation started in the early 1900s and continued on uh, to this day. Uh, Western red cedar are very valuable in both domestic and international markets. And uh, I was the forest manager at uh, Quinault when they first set up their forestry program. And uh, the Western red cedars on Quinault were individually branded. Uh, they were indicated uh, what part of the Quinault reservation these trees were harvested from and those trees were uh, subject to intensive bidding in, uh, in Japan in particular. I joined uh, the Quinault uh, Nation's forestry program back in 1975. And in 1975, uh, I was the first forest manager for the Quinault Nation. Uh, these are some of the conditions I found there. 60,000 acres of clear cut left huge forest management problems. We were looking at 220 tons per acre of logging slash, much of it red cedar, which uh, stayed on the ground for centuries. Uh, and uh, the reforestation was made virtually impossible. 
We had an extensive cedar salvage program that was operating on the uh, reservation lands. Uh, some of it involved splitting shakes. Uh, we also had a relogging program where we recovered about 35,000 board feet of cedar per acre. Uh, so that's a considerable amount of material that was left on the land. Th those uh, western red cedars were extremely valuable and remain so for modern uses in building houses, shakes and shingles, fencing, and even as uh, planks for things like uh, making salmon. What made these trees particularly valuable was the old growth heartwood. Uh, the heart was, was easily split, could be carved, it was very decay resistant. Uh, but the second growth, western red cedar, requires uh, decades to develop these valued characteristics of density and resistance to insects and decay. Uh, red cedar today are rarely planted after logging of the old growth. Uh, it's mostly re being replaced by plantations of faster growing Douglas fir and hemlock. Uh, that's about it. To give you a, a quick overview, Quinault still plants about 70 to 100,000 cedar trees per year, mostly for cultural purposes and on wet sites that are not suitable for Douglas fir or Western hemlock. So, Xiuquo, thank you. Thank you, Gary. That was an incredible um, summary, and I appreciate the, the overview of kind of the historical context of Western Red Cedar for the Quinault Indian tribe. Thank you. So we're going to hold questions until the end so that we um, make sure the speakers have enough time to get through their material. And so um, I do encourage you, if you do have questions, you can, you can ask them in the comments, but we may not get to them until the end. Um, and to the speakers, you're welcome to answer them as you have time, but don't feel obligated until um, you're welcome to wait until the end as well. So next we, um, we have uh, the privilege to hear from an indigenous member of the, the Muckleshoot Indian tribe, um, Mr. Will Willard Bill Jr., who's going to share with us about the cultural significance of Western Red Cedar. And um, I just want to say that we're really grateful to have you here with us, Willard. Thank you for joining. and. Um, uh, please feel free to introduce yourself further. Thank you. Absolutely. Atsla Hill, Willard Bill Jr. Titsta, Buckleshoot Abshid. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Willard Bill Jr. I'm an enrolled member of the Muckleshoot Indian tribe. Um, I'm a, a Duwamish and White River um, ancestral descendant and um, I serve as the cultural director for the tribe now, but my background is in education. So I started uh, working with our youth, native youth in the greater Seattle area about 30 years ago. Um, and so kind of gone back, back and forth between the reservation and Seattle schools and different programs over the last 30 years. Um, and I've served in this role for five years now. Um, so it's exciting. Still do a lot of work in education, um, but also with our cultural practitioners and our language program that makes up our cultural vision. But I'll go ahead and share my screen here. It's my, my PowerPoint and I'll kind of run through this. Oops. There we go. All right. Um, so we describe what we do on a daily basis as the living culture of Muckleshoot. And so um, the, what are the contemporary forms of what we use here? Um, and cedar, you know, that's the strand runs all through it. Um, most, most things that we do. And so we're still talking about that Western red cedar, you know, um, and Mr. Morishima talked about it earlier, you know, about it being that mother or that grandmother teacher for what we did and then provided most everything that we needed ancestrally to survive. Um, and I'll go into, go into more details with that. And um, just a couple of cool pictures here from the uh, early 1900s. The one on the left um, is out at Shosho Bay where the current um, Ballard Locks exist, but one of the last native homes that was, so a good example of a single dwelling home made out of red cedar. You can see the ocean going canoe in the bottom right hand corner there that would have also been made out of red cedar. And then down at, um, uh, in downtown Seattle area on the waterfront in the early 1900s, you can see all of the ocean going canoes that people traveled from all over and 
again, majority of those would have been made out of out of red cedar for sure. Um, the and I didn't get, I didn't want to get into a whole history lesson about who our people are, uh, but really I like the picture on the bottom left. This is uh, one of my great grandfathers down here, Chishiahod, who was the last free Native person to live in the Lake Union neighborhood, and kind of down. Um, the Portage Bay area, of, uh, kind of where University of Washington is today. Um, but a good example, one of the canoes that he made, it was a master carver um, and a freight canoe that um, him and a couple other family members are in here. So but just good visual representation here. Um, keep going. This is a contemporary canoe. So this was in the fall of 2019 when we were down commemorating the 50th anniversary of the takeover of Alcatraz. Um, so this canoe is made out of Western Red Cedar. This was carved by um, Theron Parker, who is a member of the Macaw Nation. Um, it's a whaling style canoe and Theron was, um, at that time was a young man because we're the same age. <laughs> in 1998, he was part of the Royal Whaling Crew. He was actually the harpooner of that, um, that excursion out there when they, Macaw had successfully harvested that whale. Um, so that's that our connection with this. And also this is a good example of how our people have adapted because this canoe here is not a dugout canoe. This is a contemporary hybrid model. So it's what's called a cedar strip canoe. So it strips a red cedar and then there's a fiberglass overlay and underlay on this. Um, and the reason this, this was developed about 20, 25 years ago was because it's so difficult for us to access um, old growth forest, right? So unless we can get in with the Quinaults and, and access an old growth tree, um, but this also, this hybrid model also allows us to successfully build two or three canoes out of a tree where it may not even have been big enough for one single dugout. And so it um, has worked really well for us in terms of adapting and doing that in our traditional form of transportation. Um, I just want to share this with the group, um, just some videos, so especially the one that's called Relaunch, and this talks about us revitalizing that tradition of harvesting that red cedar and turning it into, so in this one, one of our elders was teaching our young carvers about how to build a dugout river canoe, or what we often refer to as a shovel nose canoe, people most often are that, so how we traveled on those um, traditional highways in terms of our river systems on those shovel nose canoes. And so that's something you can access there. And then the, the bottom one on the paddle to muckle shoot is uh, the, uh, the pulling together is, uh, was made in 2003. It's a full length feature documentary on our fledgling um, efforts as, as a new canoe family at that time. Um, and so I can just leave that up there if you wanna copy that link or I, we can send it out to them. But it, we talk about cultural significance, we, we use, um, you know, one of the things that we've extensively used this past year because of COVID was cedar. So in a couple of ways, so we provided cedar boughs for um, cedar steams for a lot of our elder communities to cleanse and purify their homes. Um, we also have spiritual practices around using cedar in terms of spiritual cleansing. So like this past Sunday, when we woke up our canoes, it's a ceremony to bring our canoes back on the water for this spring and summer season, our ocean going canoes. Um, we use those cedar boughs to actually do a spiritual cleanse on all of our, all of our ocean going canoes. Um, but we also use cedar tea um, and significant medicine in terms of respiratory issues. And so as a lot of our elders um, that may, you know, have asthma or respiratory issues, it's a significant medicine. It's also a very, very powerful medicine. Um, so we always say we want you to consult with an expert, an herbalist or a doctor before you um, begin to use it. Um, and I, I saw that there's a couple on the Zoom here today. I know with Cinnamon Bear, who we work with, with Hancock and others, but please make sure you, uh, I always put that caveat out there. Um, please make sure you, you consult with one of the experts before doing it. Um, it's also, we also use it in tinctures um, so we can mix it with different items in terms of, and extensively use it, of course, in our cooking methods. And so if we're cooking fish on a stick or if we're smoking fish in a, in a, in a fish smokehouse, um, those are typically built out of, out of red cedar. Um, people have their preferences of what type of wood they use inside it, uh, but cedar planks uh, we use extensively um, in, in doing that work. And then the, the technology, so what's interesting is how much of this is an ancestral teaching that we still use today. So a lot of our tools, a lot of our carving tools 
um, although we use metal for uh, the blades today, so many of those are made out of Western red cedar because of the, the strength of them. Um, you know, our traditional homes, as you saw, the single family dwelling home, and also the larger big houses are what some people call long houses. We're also made out of red cedar. Um, most of our cookware came from the cedar tree. So in terms of waterproof baskets, bentwood boxes, um, cedar planks, fish sticks, all of those type of things, all of that regular cookware or spoons and, 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 and cooking utensils would have been made out of cedar. Um, some of it yellow cedar because it's, it's a little softer and, and flexible, uh, but most of it's still out of that harder wood. Um, and then extensively our work with basketry and our, and our weavers. And that's a tradition that we still carry on today, um, creating those ancestrally based baskets. And so, um, and using those for transportation, harvesting, um, a lot of gathering and wild foraging we would have used with those traditional baskets. Um, again, our paddles, um, typically not when someone's first making a paddle, we start them with yellow cedar because it's softer, but then moving into that red cedar. Um, and also uh, a traditional tool that we use a lot still today is our traditional balers for our ocean going canoes, right? So we're taking on water um, so that we can get those out quickly. And uh, I'm trying to talk really fast because I, I get excited, but I'm also trying to get <laughs> a lot of the material out there. So just to provide. So I think it's neat because as we talk as these are historical items, but we still use many of them today, right? And, and we, we were relearning when re-energizing with that. And one of the significant things for us is our partnership with Hancock Forestry, who's managing our Tamanimus Forest. And so um, for those of you who don't know that, you know, this is, uh, Cinnamon can help me here in the notes, but it's, it's almost a decade ago, we repurchased some of our traditional homeland, about 106,000 acres. And, and it's been a significant impact in our community for cultural resources, those and being able to access those natural resources and, and having that liaison in, in that role that can help us access those resources so that we can use those on a daily basis here. And then as being a teacher, we also have developed some curriculums around this. One is the Cedar Box Teaching Toolkit which I don't have enough time to talk into today, but we created some Bentwood boxes and it's full of different food sources in there, traditional and contemporary food sources that we access. And so we take that into classrooms and we can teach students directly about the importance that the cedar tree provided us and then how it helped us access these different food sources. And then we just came out with a new one. So um, dealing with all the varied issues that we do in a contemporary society, we, are working on developing a social emotional learning curriculum. And so we've worked with different groups um, at a grub out of Olympia with Elise Crone and 10 Gather Grow. Um, but then we've also created these really cool, I'm gonna try to show it to you, these little cards. And so you can see the one cedar on here and it says kindness and generosity. And I know that, and I apologize for not making slides on this. And then we literally just got these, I just got my set last week. And then you'll see the, on the back here, and it says cedar. I'm called Grandmother Cedar because I teach generosity and kindness. I offer many gifts that contribute to the health of the community. Then has some guiding questions. What does it look like to be gentle and kind? Can I receive generosity and kindness with an open heart? How can I practice generosity in my life right now? And so one of the things that we do, we operate from a seasonal calendar. And so when it's time, Great, right? because it's almost time for us to gather cedars. We will take students out doing the other things, but then we can incorporate these. It's a cool tool also for our classroom teachers, they can access, but we actually take them to the forest, we'll harvest the cedar and go into that product. It go into um, you know, project-based learning. So if they want to make a hat someday, well, you have to harvest this this year and then it'll be ready next year to actually process and do it. So it really shows um, how much work goes into it as well. Um, so when we harvest that cedar bark, we're using that. Most often that has to be cured or treated for some time period, just depending on what we're gonna make. So we still use a lot of it in our traditional regalia. You see it most predominantly in our cedar hats in today, but if you also make belts and vests and completely regalia outfits, you're seeing more and more of that um, coming out uh, in the last few years in terms of people accessing that ancestral knowledge and bringing those teachings out in full cedar regalia. Um, which is significant because that's different than any other part of the world. Most people are familiar you know, with powwow dancers and feathers and, and that, but, uh, but those teachings that come to us um, from that cedar tree. So I hope this is helpful. I know it's super fast and um, yeah, awesome. Thank you. Thanks.
Thank you, Willard Bill Jr. That was very great to hear and, and eye-opening to hear all the different uses and, and, and really actually pretty neat to see the physical cards rather than some pictures on a slide. So thank you for sharing those. That is really, really cool. Um, and you know, just for the people who are listening, in case any of you are, are landowners, I really want to emphasize that if you're felling some red cedar trees, you might look to the nearest tribe um, and, and provide those resources if you can. As Willard Bill mentioned, you know, sometimes it is difficult for tribes to access um, old growth, especially, but but West Red Cedar in general. And so just want to take this moment to to push you. To, to share that generosity like a Western Red Cedar and, and, um, and, and help support some of the tribes. So next we, um, <clears throat> we have, we're gonna shift a little bit to more of a, um, a Western perspective, if, if I may say so, but we're really grateful again to have another incredible scientist who um, has really led an important career in, in studied um, Western Red Cedar and, when when commercial foresters told her it wasn't it, it wasn't important as a commercial species, but she's still very interested. So today we're joined by um, Dr. Connie Harrington, who's a research scientist at the P um, Pacific Northwest um, Research Lab. <laughs> Excuse me, um, with the Forest Service, the Pacific Northwest Research Station. Excuse me, in in Olympia. So thank you, Connie. Um, I look forward to your, your talk about the biology and ecology of Western Red Cedar. Okay, Joey, um, I'm trying to get my screen to come up. Okay. Okay, it looks good. Good, thanks. Uh, just let me. Yeah, so as Joey mentioned, um, we're going to switch gears a little bit, talk about the biology and ecology of Western Red Cedar. And I'm going to focus part of my presentation on how red cedar is different from other trees. So when you see things in the presentation that are outlined in yellow, it's indicating areas in which red cedar differs from other tree species. I'm talking to you from my home, which is a little bit west of Olympia, and it's on the traditional land of the Squaxin Island tribe. Um, Western red cedar is the, um, the cedar that's found in low to mid elevations in this part of the world. We have other cedars in um, the Pacific Northwest, but uh, for example, in Washington, yellow cedar is found mostly at higher elevations. In terms of taxonomy, Western red cedar is in the Cypress family. Um, it's the only member of the, that, the Thuya is the only, um, red cedar is the only member of the Thuya's on the West Coast. There's another one on the East Coast and in other parts of the world. As I think you all know, it has scale-like leaves. It doesn't have needles like a pine or a fir would. Yeah. The new shoot growth is not stored in large buds as most other trees have. It has a very low winter dormancy requirement. It's shade tolerant and has less genetic variation than many other tree species. Um, so I mentioned it has uh, very little tiny vegetative buds. I used to say it didn't have any buds, but technically it has buds, but they're just so small that we can't really see them. So um, a fir, a pine, a large alder on the right, they all have kind of these buds that have um, coverings over them in the winter, bud scales that protect the new leaves. But red cedar doesn't have that. It just has these tiny little kind of microscopic structures where the new buds are going to come out. I had to switch computers at the last minute. My computer wasn't working. I'm on my husband's computer and have to keep finding where the page down arrow is. <laughs> so uh, if it doesn't have these vegetative buds, these large vegetative buds, it means it doesn't have a leaf bank 
So there aren't a bunch of leaf structures, kind of large leaf structures ready to go um, that are protected inside bud scales. So it's more sensitive to dry conditions and it has greater herbicide sensitivity for a, a long, longer period of time during the season. On the other hand, because of the way that it kind of grows along, it can grow when conditions are favorable. So it can get an earlier start to the growing season. So just for example, this is one where we're comparing the growth of the leader of Western red cedar and Douglas fir. And this came from up on Vancouver Island. And the Western red cedar is um, starting earlier in the year than the Douglas fir and it also is growing later in the year than, than Douglas fir. Um, and this is one where we're comparing height growth and diameter growth. We have these cool little electronic dendrometers that we can put to very carefully look at how the um, diameter of the tree, or in this case, a little seedling is growing. And you can see that the diameter growth is starting back in February whereas the height growth is not starting, say, till uh, late March or early April. And um, uh, just another example of how red cedar tends to start earlier than some of its compatriots. So this is a comparison with Sitka spruce, where we can see that the red cedar is getting started um, just a little bit earlier and getting quite a bit of its diameter growth um, starting earlier compared to Sitka spruce. So I mentioned that uh, red cedar has a low uh, dormancy requirement. That is most of our trees require that um, some cold temperatures before the warm temperatures in the spring um, are really effective, but red cedar has a lower cold requirement than many of the other tree species. So based on information that we collected from a lot of different sources, we were able to develop some models. And you can see here, we've modeled when um, the new shoot growth would start. And in our area, it would start in this kind of late March to April time period. But we predict in the future as temperatures, the temperature patterns change, that the new growth for red cedar will start earlier. So in our area, it would probably start in early March rather than later in March or in April. So I don't wanna to get too deep into all the weeds of what can happen in terms of physiology, but I just wanted to mention that red cedar is considered to have fairly low drought tolerance. Um, with its leaves being less protected by uh, waxy layers than some of the other species. And then another thing I think people are often interested in or haven't really thought much about um, is why cedar leaves turn this kind of reddish brown in the winter. And I always like to include information on this when I give a presentation because I often hear people say that they ordered seedlings from a nursery and they came and they looked terrible. They were all kind of brown looking or reddish brown. And they didn't realize that that is, um, uh, that's very common for red cedar to change color uh, in the winter. And what happens and just kind of big picture is that the plants produce this chemical called rhodoxanthin in the fall um, that acts as kind of a sunscreen and also occurs along with cold hardening. And then in the spring, the rhodoxanthin disappears and there's this rapid recovery of photosynthetic rates. But light plays a role. So if you see cedar seedlings under the shade, um, you don't see that foliage color change. They'll stay that nice green color. But if you're out in an open area, many of the trees will um, turn that kind of uh, brown color. Um, but there's some genetic variation in that. And actually you can buy um, 
planting stock from a like a commercial nursery with something called green sport that won't change color. So what I always tell people who are worried about their trees being kind of red brown foliage is to look at the underside of the leaves. So if you just turn them over, you look at the underside, if it's green, then it's normal. If it's brown on both sides, that's probably not a good sign. And also I always kind of pull the, the branches the, and if it feels kind of soft and pliable, then the red brown foliage um, is just kind of the normal winter change in coloration and not something you should be worried about. But if it's real, if it doesn't feel that soft, pliable, but more rough and brittle, then it probably is something that's of concern. So reproduction, um, red cedar is kind of a, an interesting one. It has um, both the males and the females, not only on the same tree, they can even be on the same branch. Um, we can zoom in and look at the male and female um, flowers, little mini cones. And if you wanted to see these purpley um, or reddish looking pollen flowers, um, it would probably be like in February. They happen quite early and you can see how these scales open up and then there's pollen uh, grains behind them that will then be um, distributed. And many times people will say, well, something's bothering my allergies, but I don't know what would be flowering this early. <laughs> and often it's red cedar in some places. And the, um, the female flowers then produce small cones that just have a few seeds um, per cone. And Western red cedar seed can germinate in the fall. And so this is just from some trials we did. And these, um, just like two weeks after we started the trial on these warmer temperatures, we had very high germination of the red cedar. But in comparison, the Douglas fir had much delayed germination um, and, and may have taken months at, at a particular temperature. So if you see little tiny seedlings in the fall, you know that, that can be uh, natural and not something to be worried about. Rooting, um, red cedar can have kind of a profuse, dense network of fine roots, but of course it also has uh, coarse roots. People commonly say that red cedar has, is a shallow rooted species, but that isn't um, true on all sites. In, in fact, on well-drained soils, Western red cedar is as deeply rooted as Douglas fir and Western hemlock. Ice is a scientist up in um, Canada, and he did a study with hydraulic excavation using these big fire hoses and pulled all the soil away um, from the roots of these different species and was able to show that on those well-drained kind of glacial outwash soils, Western red cedar roots went down just as far as Douglas fir and Western hemlock. On the other hand, Western red cedar can tolerate wet conditions. And under those conditions, the root systems are going to be much shallower. So just an example of the fibrous roots. These are some seedlings from the Washington DNR Webster Nursery near Olympia. And you can see the red cedar um, seedling looks uh, like kind of a mop of fine roots, whereas the Douglas fir has, um, you know, fewer roots and and uh, not that same type of distribution. Um, but as I mentioned on wet sites, uh, the root system can be fairly shallow and, and go along really at the top of the soil. But just remember the rooting really depends on the soil texture and the drainage. So um, I hope you'll remember that Western red cedar is not shallowly rooted on all, all soils, but just in some cases. Um, and then also red cedar is one of the species that can reproduce vegetatively. So the branch, that means the branches can root um, and that can be done um, deliberately. It can happen naturally. It can be encouraged um, using hormone treatments. Um, 
cuttings can be taken in, in a, a greenhouse, but, um, but, and also you can see on fallen trees that have branches, but the roots are still into the ground that these branches can develop into very large trees, but they're not individual trees. They're all part of the original uh, tree that fell. Um, so the previous speakers talked about some of the wood properties of red cedar in terms of all the wonderful uses that can be made of it. Um, it's a lightweight wood, soft, straight grain. Um, from a technical standpoint, most of the ring width is early wood. And so that's a little different than some of the other species that may have a wider amounts of the late wood or the darker, denser um, part of the wood. And of course, we all know red cedar has that nice aromatic um, odor. So um, I think it's interesting to think about how water movement it goes through tree stems. It depends on the gradient in the water from the soil to the atmosphere. And sometimes people talk about the water movement as like, well, you, it's like sucking on a straw, just having the water being pulled up from the root system out to the atmosphere. But it's a lot more complicated than that. And um, for one thing, you don't have just a few big straws, <laughs> uh, but the, the elements, the xylem, that the, the part of the, tree stem that's conducting the water is lots of little cells, these xylem cells, and they connect with openings called pits. And then these pits can be closed to prevent cavitation, that's the air in the cells from spreading under stress. So it's really important that tree species have uh, um, developed all kinds of different methods to help um, help them um, prevent uh, complete loss of water under high stress, but the methods of closure really vary by species. So uh, this is an example about the different um, membranes in the cells and most conifers um, in the world, including most in the Northwest, have a structure called a torus which is this kind of fat area in the middle of this Douglas fir. But red cedar doesn't have a torus, and so it can't close the cells. Um, the, um, it can't close the openings between the cells in the same way. There is some restriction to the water movement, but it can't close them in the same way. So anyway, it's kind of interesting that red cedar differs from so many other species. The other thing is we talk about red cedar having straight grain, um, but it also has a straight path for water transport. So if you put water in, or in this case, these researchers put dye into tree stems down at the bottom, and then they could see how the water or the dye moved through the tree as it went up. Um, whereas Douglas fir and hemlock have a different pattern. It's called uh, winding ascent. So it's not going up straight, but it's going around in a wind winding pattern. So a few quick comments about ecology. Um, red cedar can grow on a wide range of sites. People tend to think of it as a wet site species, species but it can actually grow on sites from very wet to rocky and dry. But like most species, it grows best on um, kind of moderate, well-drained sites. Um, it can survive in the overstory, midstory, or understory because it's very shade tolerant, very long-lived. The foliage is palatable to many species. It's a calcium accumulator, meaning it moves soil, moves calcium from deep in the soil to the surface, and it's a consistent seed producer. So the shade tolerance means the branches can survive in the understory. So it has a very different look than some of the other species. You can see here we have a, a, like a Douglas fir stem and it doesn't have any branches as opposed to these cedars that have many of these lower branches. Red cedar foliage is an important wildlife food for many animals, um, especially during the winter. And in many places, certainly the deer and the elk are, are a challenge to 
reforestation efforts, but it's also important to recognize that it's a long-term um, uh, long partnership between these plants and animals. Red cedar can live for more than a thousand years. Um, this was a huge red cedar um, in the Olympic National Park. Unfortunately, this great giant is no longer standing, but I was fortunate to be able to see it when I was a few years younger. Um, as I mentioned on wet sites, it can be shallow rooted and it can be wind thrown on those wet sites. It's less susceptible to diseases than many other conifers, um, but it's, it's long, so long lived that trees that live for a long time problems can kind of catch up to it. Some people have had uh, problems with a cedar leaf blight, especially uh, seedlings in areas of poor air drainage. And then recently there have been reports of top dieback and death, and Joey's going to be talking um, more about that. But hopefully some of the information that I've provided will help you understand why we may be having some top dieback and death. Very little insect damage um, with red cedar some little gall midges and weevils, sometimes a boar. There's a sap sucker damage, a woodpecker damage on bowls. Um, on the other hand, the cedar oils and bark and foliage may deter insects and slugs. I, I know when I plant um, primroses in the spring, I often put cedar foliage around the primroses as a natural slug deterrent. So for people who are interested in these topics, there's um, several kind of general um, resources available online. And um, I've provided a copy of my presentation as a PDF and hopefully we can get it to anyone who'd be interested and you can go to these um, resources and, and get more information. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over to Joey and um, I'll answer questions at the end. Okay, <clears throat> thank you so much, Connie. That was that was amazing. West Red Cedar is such a cool species. It's, uh, it's really neat to see how unique it is. And um, so now you've just added another piece to this where we've, we've heard why West Red Cedar is important in kind of the historical legacy of some of our um, communities and the cultural legacy and cultural heritage of the Northwest and now the ecological importance. Um, and so thank you, Connie, for, for adding that piece. So now I'm gonna um, take the stage and share my screen for a little bit and I'll try and rush through this so we can um, have some good discussion at the end. I see there's been a lot of questions already and Connie, if if you're able to answer a couple of them um, while I'm talking, that would be helpful because I don't know if we'll have time to get to all of them. But please keep the questions coming and we'll do our best to, to answer them in time. All right. So once again, thanks for, for joining us and, and being here today. Um, it's really an honor to be part of this panel and to be with so many incredible um, speakers and, and topics. And um, I unfortunately get the, the sad news part where I'm gonna talk a little bit about some concerns we have with the dieback and, um, but then also highlight some of the possible ways we can work together to, to try and find solutions and ensure that this, this species remains on the landscape for future generations. So I'm going to start by, by introducing myself and then talk about, I'll just show a few slides and pictures of the dieback that we've been seeing and talk about a community science initiative that we've, um, we've established as a result. And before I begin, I just want to acknowledge that I have the, the sincere privilege to, um, to explore and learn and study and research and discover on the traditional homelands of the Puyallup tribe of Indians. And um, I'm based in the Puyallup Research and Extension Center, um, but I actually live in Tacoma and I'm coming to you now from Tacoma. But I do wanna highlight this tool, the nativeland.ca tool, 
um, because I noticed that Laura had asked, asked a question about which, um, you know, which tribe may be closest to her property. And I, I really want to emphasize the, the, the utility of this tool to really explore um, the territories and the, the homelands that you may be occupying. Um, and so that's publicly available at nativeland.ca. So I, I mentioned that I'm coming to you from the Puyallup um, Research and Extension Center from, from WSU. There I'm supported with the postdoctoral fellowship by the United States Department of Ag um, through the NIFA program, the National Institute of Food and Ag. And I'm part of a program called the Ornamental Plant Pathology Program. And there I'm mentored by um, a gentleman named Gary Chastagner and um, a researcher named Marianne Elliott. And then we also have a center director named Todd Murray. And I just wanna highlight all of them because we're, we're resources to all of you. And I encourage you to contact us and find out more about our program and how we can help um, with our research program. We do a lot of research on, on different forest health topics. And um, the program I'm gonna introduce is a, is a kind of a child of that program. So I'm going to just quickly summarize some of the concern we're seeing with Western Red Cedar. Um, throughout the region, we're starting to see a lot of dieback, and, and some landowners have indicated they've been seeing this dieback for 10 years or more, but um, it does seem like it's becoming uh, more urgent and more frequent um, as, as we experience more droughts and things like that. So sometimes we see entire trees die. Um, sometimes it starts with the, the thinning of a canopy, um, where other times it might be a top dieback and kind of a slow progression over time. Um, they can be in open fields or they can be in the middle of a dense forest. It's, it's kind of confusing. And so to illustrate some of the things we're seeing in the region, I'm just going to highlight some observations that have been shared by community scientists. Um, and so we're starting here. These are our observations in Portland. Um, where we see this again, top dieback and thinning, and again, some more top dieback. Um, we also have observations around King County. Um, Paul Fisher's on the call here. He's seen a lot and he works for King County. Um, we've also seen, um, I guess these are mostly around Olympia and, and, and um, Tacoma. Um, but again, more examples of top dieback and it's kind of the symptoms that we're seeing around the region. Um, here's Olympia. This is actually Victoria, Canada. And to, and to just to illustrate again, um, we're also seeing Radu has shared many observations from Vancouver um, with these same symptoms. So, and I was on a phone call recently, um, actually in a research update with a member, with someone from Alaska who is also indicating they're seeing top dieback in some of the young Western Red Cedars. So we're seeing this dieback throughout the entire range, it seems like, at least on the west side. And this has been picked up by a lot of news sources and the concern has been amplified. Um, Vic Vancouver, we just saw some photos, you know, Vancouver park officials alar alarmed by urban forest drought. Um, dead tree after dead tree, the case for Washington's dying foliage. There's just um, an abundance of, of news sources that are highlighting this dieback. And we can also look to some data provided by the, the Forest Service where they fly um, airplanes in partnership over with uh, state agencies such as Washington Department of Natural Resources. And in 2017, they started noting where they saw Western Red Cedar die back. And every year it's just been more and more. And I just really wanna emphasize that this is, this is, there's some urgency to this. We're talking to many people who don't wanna plant Western Red Cedar anymore because they're seeing this die back. And that's a tragedy considering the cultural importance and the ecological importance we just heard the other speakers talk about. So one potential solution may be to, um, to try and find answers with community science. And, and I really wanna emphasize um, how this will help. And that's kind of the, the point of the next few slides and the, the, the remainder of my talk. So we, we established a community science program called the Forest Health Watch with the main goal as the pilot project to, to amplify the issue and find more information about the Western Red Cedar dieback. You can find more information about the Forest Health Watch at our website, foresthealth.org. We started it last year, um, but it's really been shaped by an incredible number of partners. Um, 
and we, we have some working relationships with tribes, but I didn't want to include logos to tokenize anyone in this. So um, this slide just emphasizes the number of people that have collaborated and been involved in the input of the program and the shaping of the program. But without spending too much time on this, I just wanted to highlight that there's a lot of different resources for the community in behind the Western Red Cedar or behind the, the Forest Health Watch program. And I really want to emphasize that we are hosting research updates every month. And so you can come and see what we're seeing, what patterns are emerging with the Western Red Cedar um, data that's being shared by community scientists. And those, again, happen every month. And we also have office hours that anyone can pitch up to and ask us questions and things like that. And so more information about the Forest Health Watch program on foresthealth.org. Now I'm gonna quickly highlight how some community scientists are contributing to this Western Red Cedar dieback issue and how we're improving our understanding. We worked um, in conjunction with uh, state and federal agencies, uh, specifically these individuals from um, from Christine Bull from Oregon Department of Forestry and Betsy Goodrich from the Forest Health and Protection out of Wenatchee um, and, and Melissa Fishner from um, Washington Department of Natural Resources. And, and what we did is we extended some work they're already doing to a public interface called iNaturalist. And iNaturalist is a free and open app. Um, the data is all completely open and you're welcome to go and explore it. Um, and it's an already existing smartphone app. But what we did is we created a project within the app called the Western Red Cedar Dieback Map. And the way that it works is that um, community scientists can join or anyone can join the project. But then when they share a picture or an observation on our naturalist, they tag the project. And when they tag the project, it asks a few extra questions. It asks, what symptoms did you see? Did you see um, a thinning canopy? Or did you see top dieback? Did you see the entire tree was dead? You know, so we're starting to get at what symptoms did you see? It all also asks, did you see any evidence of other possible factors? You know, what else might explain why the tree is dying back? Did you see some, some activity of a fungus or any, any evidence of a wood borer or a bark beetle or invasive plants? You know, trying to get at what other factors might be contributing to the dieback. Then it asks questions about the sites. You know, is the tree next to a road, or is it out in the middle of a field, or um, is it in the middle of a forest? You know, understanding where um, trees are vulnerable is kind of the goal of, of these site questions. And so, so far, um, this is captured from this morning. We, you know, we've we're. We're getting up there. We got a few hundred observations. And what's great is that it's really spanning this kind of range. It's really become an international movement, if you will, to understand what's going on with the Western Red Cedar. We also have some um, kind of more beautiful visualization of, of the data on our website at foresthealth.org slash analyses. And um, we're really fortunate that this gentleman named Tyler Sheldon helped us um, make sure that these, these um, dashboards update every day. So you can go there every day and see kind of an update of how the data is looking and what's, what's emerging. And within 2021, we're trying to get 2021 observations. So um, I think this one's not quite updated, but we're almost about 20% of our goal. And so help us reach our goal by the end of the year. Um, oops. I guess if you, if you're, are you still with me on this browser? I'll just highlight that. Um, again, this is the forcehealth.org webpage where you can go and see an updated version of these, um, these data anytime you want. Um, there's also a little visualization of some of the analyses um, or looking a little bit into the patterns we're seeing and the symptoms and things like that. And again, I'm just illustrating that um, we're really seeing this distribution, at least in the lowlands on the west side of, of the Cascades. So I welcome you to go and explore those data a little more. It's on our website. Now I'm gonna briefly speak about how these data will help in the big picture of ensuring that Western Red Cedar remains on our landscape for future generations. 
So one is starting to give us a good idea of where dieback is occurring and where it is not. Um, we ask people to share observations of healthy trees in addition to unhealthy trees. So that way um, we get a good understanding of where trees are he healthy and unhealthy. These are a really early stage example of some of the, the site characteristics we're starting to see. So don't take these literally, but it's just demonstrating that we're starting to figure out where trees may be vulnerable. What site conditions are, are, um, are there patterns of where trees are dying, right? We also hope that with enough observations, enough observations we'll be able to identify which environmental parameters are the most important for explaining where we're seeing Western red cedar dieback. Is it precipitation? Is it temperature? Is it the number of days without any precipitation? You know, those kind of different parameters are all useful for explaining um, where, explaining and predicting where Western red cedar might be vulnerable. Um, once we have those, those idea of, of the environmental parameters that are important, we can use tools like the seed lot selection tool as well to, to better select where we get our resources and our seed stock. Um, at the moment, this tool is available and you're welcome to use it, but the limitation is that we don't know which climate, climatic variable to start making those decisions. And then finally, once we have an understanding of where Western red cedar is vulnerable, and then which environmental parameters might be the most important for dictating how healthy the tree is, we can start to screen other populations against those parameters to really try and identify populations that might be um, better adapted to future conditions or more tolerant to droughts, for example. And by doing that, we can ensure that we keep Western red cedar on the landscape rather than shifting our, our cities or our landscapes to, to species that are not um, native to this region. So really, I just wanna emphasize that together we, we can find solutions and in, in this community science program is really open um, to your feedback and partnership. And I really welcome you um, to help shape it into something that, that provides useful information. So please check out our website and follow up with me if you have any more questions. Um, but it, I'm gonna turn it back over to, to Cass now and we're gonna try and get through some of these questions with the, <laughs> with the I guess maybe we're out of time, but 